Welcome to Ask Ishan. So, under coronavirus situation, many of us may be struggling to find any facial masks to buy everywhere. So, what can we do? Should we just make some masks at home, use whatever materials available? Are they even effective? And are they comfortable enough to wear? And if we have some masks available, what's the difference between different types of masks? For example, N95 versus surgical mask. Are they helpful at all? So how can we find out? Today we have Dr. Thomas Tohim. He is associate professor of behavioral science at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, and he is the founder of Smart Air. A social enterprise that promotes open data and low-cost air purifiers to really help people cope with air pollution in both China and India. So today he will review with us a lot of data that from published literature to help us understand the science behind mask usage. Welcome, Thomas. Hey, Ishan. Nice to nice to be chatting with you. Yeah, nice to see you again. So,、um, before we get started, do you want to explain or introduce yourself to the audience a little bit, like who you are, what you are doing right now? Yeah. So I'm an assist.、Uh, well, I used to be assistant, now associate professor、uh, at the University of Chicago.、Um, I'm at the Booth School of Business, but. Don't let that fool you. I don't really know anything about business.、Um, I am merely a cultural psychologist, so I study culture, and I do a lot of my research in China, and I spend a lot of time living in China.、Um, now, listeners are probably wondering why would this person know anything about masks? Then,、um, and that is a total accident.、Um, I was you know, lived in China for six or seven years in my life, and throughout my time of living in China. I became more and more aware of air pollution and what to do about it. And I think most people, when approaching that problem, would just go out and buy things to to try to fix it, buy an air purifier, buy a mask.、Um, but my approach was, I wanted to figure things out and figure out whether it works. In particular, I was worried that, you know, a lot of companies say, "Oh, you need to buy our thousand dollar air purifier," and I thought, like, really? Do, you know, is there, do you really need to spend that much money? Does it have to be that expensive? And so I researched it, and I found out that I could make my own purifier for thirty dollars. Wow!、Uh, and I tested it at home, and then I published all the data, and then eventually I started teaching other people how to do this. Like, hey, you don't have to spend a thousand dollars; you can protect yourself like this. Here's how to do it. Here's the data, and then eventually that turned into a social enterprise that I call Smart Air. And Smart Air is is just you know we provide some masks, but mostly just simple air purifiers, and our goal is to first. Just reduce the cost of clean air.、Um, the idea is that you know these machines are really simple. You don't need to spend a thousand dollars. Don't listen to marketing. Don't listen to you know claims about superior technology that happens to cost way more than other things. Just it's a simple science.、Um, and then we also do open data tests, and it's the same sort of thing, right? Like、mm-hmm. our our belief is that if people understand how things like air purifiers and masks work. Number one, they'd be better able to protect themselves. But number two, they wouldn't be wasting money on companies that are convincing them about things that don't really need to cost that much money.、Um, and so, along with the coronavirus, like when that came out, there were a lot of questions about: Do masks work? Do they capture really small particles? Do air purifiers capture virus particles? Things like that. And we had a lot of、uh, data on this, and we continue to do more tests on, you know, masks and different materials for masks.、Um, and so. That's you know we were just sort of doing that already as an organization, and it, it happened to be really useful during the during the coronavirus stuff. So yeah, we've been putting、definitely. out tests and stuff of of masks. Right, sounds I especially like the data driven part. Sounds like you've been collecting the data to really show yourself and other people that they really work before just to make the air more clean, but at a much lower cost. But right now, under the coronavirus situation, we all really need masks. I have a lot of friends here, and I hear a lot of news that people, even people, realize mask is important. They still cannot find where to buy it. 
Uh, and also a lot of people I know still out there don't believe in wearing mask gonna really help with the situation, right? Yeah, and there's been so much conflicting advice on masks. I mean, when back in February and early March in the US, for example, like the Surgeon General was out telling people and he literally had a tweet saying masks are not effective at this. And so he was telling people to stop buying masks. Um, and so we're getting conflicting, you know, sometimes they're saying it, they're not effective. Sometimes they're saying only sick people should wear masks, but not healthy people. But now more recently it's changed to, oh, actually healthy people should wear them too. And it, it, it's kind of all over the place. And it, it shocks me because I should say I'm not an expert in air pollution or masks. Listeners should definitely know that. I don't ask anybody to believe what I say. Everything that I'm going to say is going to be based on data, uh, either tests that I've done or, or peer reviewed research that I've read. And so people should look at the data for themselves. They should not just believe what I say, should look at the data. Um, but it shocks me that the, the recommendations have been all over the place because the data is not all over the place. The data is actually quite clear when you look at it. And we'll talk about that today. But, but I hope one thing that listeners come away with is, is the science on this is a lot more settled than what people have been saying. And when people are giving recommendations, a lot of the times, I honestly think they just haven't read the research. You know, like it takes time to go download these peer reviewed papers and actually look into it. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of the time people just haven't, right? They're giving sort of their intuition or their understanding or what they've heard from other people. Um, so today, what listeners are gonna get is data. We're gonna talk about how people have tested these questions directly. So right. I think that'll be one nice sort of theme to take away from today. Yeah, I think that can be very valuable, not only finding the reliable data or like a lot of data outside, but also how to interpret the data Yeah. Uh -huh, with a very like objective way, uh, especially for you, someone been doing research for so many years in this field, you possibly take data uh, in a very different approach than the social media than other um, people outside of this research field, how they explain the data. I know a lot of times there are misunderstandings and uh, uh, just take part of the data and, uh, you know, uh, ampli amplify that and make it very a huge deal, but miss a lot of other pictures. Yeah, like one of my favorite examples of this in the in the mask research is, so there's, there's a question of, of whether or not um, uh, giving masks to just regular people, not healthcare workers, not experts, you know, people who've been trained, but just regular people do masks work. And there are two different ways to frame those results. One is to say, and they're both accurate to the data, but they're just mm -hmm. different ways of framing it. One is you can look at the overall results. So there was a study in Australia where they, they randomized um, just regular parents uh, whose kids had the flu. They randomized the, this is just the regular flu, it's not the coronavirus. This study mm. was years ago. Mm. Um, they randomized the parents to wear a mask or not at home while they were taking care of their kid who had the flu. Now, the overall effect of people who were randomized to wear masks was not significant. So there was, there was no difference in how many parents got infected wearing a mask versus not wearing a mask. However, the problem is a lot of these parents stopped wearing the mask. People aren't wearing, you know, used to wearing masks. People sometimes find them uncomfortable. Um, or sometimes parents reported their kids didn't like that they were, the parents were wearing a mask. Maybe they thought it was scary. Mm -hmm. And so the parents stopped wearing a mask, right? Well, mm -hmm. if you remove those people, if you analyze separately the data from the parents who actually wore the masks continuously, you know, throughout the study period, versus the pe parents who didn't wear the, who stopped wearing the masks, well, then different stories emerge. For the parents who stopped wearing the masks, not surprisingly, they don't work, right? Mm. That's not a headline, right? People right. who stop wearing masks, they stop working, right? But for the parents who continued to wear the masks, there was a significant effect of, of mask usage, right? Mm. And so two people could, could describe that, especially in a very brief news story, Somebody could say, hey, this study found that masks don't work when they're not worn by, you know, when they're worn by regular people, right? It's true, right? The problem mm -hmm. is if you look in the data, it really tells us masks do work. You just have to wear them conscientiously. Mm -hmm. You have to keep wearing them, right? 
the interesting thing to me there is that's a question of data interpretation, right? Or how do we communicate right. this data? They're both right, but it's just a little bit more complicated than they do or they don't work. Right. right. Yeah. So now I really look forward to your takeaway from some, some of the data about masks. Yeah. Um, like I know your resource of finding data and other researchers, a way you dig in really the tiny uh, details, a lot of general public audience may not know how to do it, may not have the time. Even yeah. when you throw a paper to them, they may get very confused. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, where should we get started? Yeah, I think a, a really basic question that mm -hmm. a lot of people are asking is, do things like masks and air purifiers capture virus particles, right? Right. Now, people's intuition on this is that viruses are really small, and so therefore they probably don't capture viruses, right? Um, there's, well, there's two things to know about this. One is sometimes viruses, sometimes, oftentimes, viruses will travel on water droplets. So people, people might have heard of this, you know, like you sneeze, water comes out, and the virus is not flying by itself, but it's actually flying on a piece of water or a droplet of water. And so that makes the particle size bigger. But viruses can also travel without water. Um, so it's, it's a relevant question. Now, people's intuition here is that the smaller the particle, the harder it is to capture. Oddly enough, that's not true. There's a really weird thing about filtration. When you have a, um, a fiber filter, like in a mask or in an air purifier, you have what's called a HEPA filter, which is just fibers. Um, mm -hmm. It is true that the smaller the particle, the harder it is to capture until you get down to very small particles. When you get down to very small particles, what happens is they're so small that when they travel through the air, they get bounced around by air molecules, right? Mm. We're talking about very, very small particles here, right? They hit a molecule of air, and because they're so small, it actually bounces off the air. And then it hits another air molecule and it bounces. So these particles are so small that they can fit through a filter. Right, mm -hmm. if you just could you know, take a really small particle and try to fit it through a filter, it, it can fit, right? It's that small. But the thing is because it, they're so small, they get bounced by air molecules, they end up hitting the fibers anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Because they fly in these random patterns, mm -hmm. because they get bounced around. That's called Brownian motion. That's the, the scientific name for that. But anyway, th that's sort of the theoretical explanation. Let's, let's talk about some data, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the relevant data here is well, I'll share my screen first so you can, we can look at some data here. Sure. So just to clarify, this is not, for this data specifically, it's not directly about coronavirus. Yeah, so what we're going to see is, yeah, so that's a theoretical explanation mm -hmm. of why filters can capture really small particles, mm -hmm. right? Now, in the data that, that we're going to see, we actually will see tests where researchers shoot virus particles mm. at filters. Okay. And then we'll see how many, how many do they capture, right? Sure. Now, scientists haven't done this with the coronavirus because that's, it's too new. I mean, mm -hmm. that, we just haven't had the time to do that. But what I'll show you is we'll show you viruses that are both larger and smaller than the coronavirus. And we'll, what we're going to find is that they're effective, right? Cool. So it would be really weird if filters could capture particles that are bigger and smaller than the coronavirus that are also viruses. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow wouldn't be able to capture the, I mean, it seem, seems basically impossible. Right. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll also see particles that are at this, the same size as the coronavirus. So, okay. So no tests I'm going to show you. We, we just don't have tests of the coronavirus itself, mm -hmm. but we have tests of other viruses and other right. particles that are the same size. Yeah. So that's, let's that's take a look. We'll yeah. All right. Let me just share my screen here. All right. So. Here's what we want, all right. So the first question is, um, how big is the coronavirus? Um, what is the size of those particles? Um, this we do have an answer for already. Scientists have already measured the, the coronavirus under, under electron microscopes. And what they find is on average, the diameter is 0.125 microns. 0.125 microns, very small, right? Mm -hmm. um, here's an idea, this, this gives you a sense of how big that is, right? So this is, mm. for example, right here is a red blood cell. That's seven microns. Um, people might 
be familiar with PM 2.5. These are, right. this is a, a category of pollution. These are basically pollution particles that can penetrate deep into our lungs. That's 2.5 microns. Um, here is a, a type of bacteria that's 0.5 microns. And the coronavirus is 0.1 microns. So we're talking about very small particles right mm. there. So that's wow. really the size. Uh, a human hair would be even larger than the biggest particle you're seeing right here. Um, and so what, what you'll see, for example, we through Smart Air, we've pointed out how in the media, people are making the opposite claim from us. So this one's interesting. This one's in uh, Business Insider. Um, they say N95 masks. So these are those sort of fancy masks that you'll see sometimes in hospitals and construction workers wearing. Mm -hmm. um, they say N95 masks filter out airborne particles down to 0.3 microns in diameter. Now, remember, the coronavirus is 0.12. Right. So that's smaller, smaller. than that. Uh -huh. So anybody reading that would say, oh, so it doesn't filter out the coronavirus, right? It's smaller than that, so it doesn't filter it out, right? I had the same totally question. Totally reasonable mm -hmm. intuition, makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. It's just totally wrong. <laughs> it, just <happens> to be, <laughs> it just happens to be totally wrong, right? And, and I don't mean to say that, like, other people are so dumb, I'm so smart. Like, I thought this when I first started looking into these questions, right? When I first mm -hmm. started getting an air purifier, I thought that this, this is, that totally made sense to me. Right. right, just think about size, right? It does not work. It should yeah. not work. Mm -hmm. it, and, the, and the problem is, I think the really interesting thing is, we think of, when we think of filters, we think of things on the scale that we can understand, objects that we can understand, right? So if you've ever used like a strainer to strain like pasta in the sink, mm -hmm. like we can understand that, right? If the pasta is bigger than the holes, right. then it gets, stays in the bowl. Mm -hmm. And if it's smaller than the holes, then it goes through. Mm -hmm. Simple. Like, I understand that. But the problem is things get really different when we talk about really, really small particles. That's when things start behaving differently. And we don't have a metaphor for that, right? Like, we don't experience things that small. And so our intuition is just, is just not right about that, right? Um, but let, let's look at the data. So researchers have tested this question, right? And the way they tested it, this is, this is not a scientific picture. It's just my cartoonish drawing of this. Oh. What they do is they, they put, for example, right here, you have a, a diesel generator. You know, so you, you have diesel and gasoline. Um, and they have a pipe. And then they put a mask on the end of that. And then they use what's called a, a particle counter to test for very small particles. So how many of those particles can go through the mask? Now, this machine tests down to 0 0.007 microns. So this is even smaller than the coronavirus, right? right? We're talking about very, very small particles here. And here's what they find. So this is the percentage of particles that are blocked by different masks. So in this study, they found that a cotton handkerchief, for example, blocked 28%. Surgical mask was 80%. Mm. And then this, uh, this one right here that I have like a little picture of, that's like a, an N95 mask. That blocked over 95%. It was 96.6%. Mm. So even when we include these very small particles, masks can capture them. And even the cotton here, right? It's mm -hmm. not nothing. It's, right. it's, it's not a professional mask. But I don't think anybody thinks that cotton is going to be equivalent to a professional mask, right? The question is, is it better than nothing, right? Um, so, okay, so, so what we've established here is that different mask materials, even just cotton, can capture particles that small. But I remember I, I posted this data and somebody asked me, but what, you know, what about virus particles? Maybe viruses are different. Maybe they have a different shape or something like that. Well, the interesting thing is researchers have shot actual virus particles at masks. Mm -hmm. And here's what they found. That's, that's what this graph is. Now, this is a little complicated, so I'll walk you through it. Right here, this is penetration. So this is what percentage of particles can make it through the mask, right? So what we want is we want this to be very low, right? We want not very many viruses to, to get through the mask, right? Um, and so here's what they find. These are viruses of different diameters. So we have uh, 20 nanometers here, which is even smaller than the coronavirus. And then we have up to 80 nanometers. It's just bottom line is these are very small virus particles. Um, the two different lines here are different airflows. This bottom line is if you're breathing sort of moderately. This 
this line right here is if you're breathing heavily. Um, and so if you're breathing heavily, um, the filtration of a mask is slightly less effective is what you can see. But what you can see here is that this dotted line right here is 5%. And remember, these are N95 masks, so we would hope that they can capture 95%. Mm -hmm. Or in other words, about 5% of particles are gonna get through. And that's what they find, right? So on, when people are breathing heavily through these masks, this is actually on a, in a lab, it's not on somebody's face, but it's just, just testing them to yours. Um, the worst performance here is about 95.5%. So they're capturing about 95.5%. Or, or put it another way, about 4% of the virus particles are going through the mask. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So we're yeah. talking about actual virus particles shot at real masks, these are not like simulated masks, these are just masks that people can buy um, online. Well, if, if they were available right now, you could buy these online. Uh, this, this one is a 3M mask right here that they were testing, mm. right? Um, there are differences between masks. This is a mask that researchers tested that had scored slightly worse in earlier tests. Um, and you can see the penetration here is slightly higher. It's slightly above 5% when people are breathing or when they used a heavy um, airflow, but not by much. It's about 94% effective, right? So the mask was capturing 94% of the virus particles that were being shot at it, right? Mm. So simple answer here, you shoot viruses at masks and they capture the, the viruses. Um, yeah, so masks next question, works. So, so masks can capture viruses, right? right? And now we can remember too that if a mask is, if a virus is traveling on a water droplet, we're probably going to capture even more than the percentages here, mm. right? Because the water droplet's going to be quite a large uh, particle. Right. Now people look at this and they might say, okay, well, those are just testing whether particles get captured by the mask. But what about if you actually wear a mask, right? People think if you actually wear a mask, maybe the air is going to leak through the sides of the mask, right? Mm. So you can test this by having people actually wear a mask. Um, and I've done a test like this. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to the, the lab of 3M in Beijing. Oh, cool. And yeah, that looked like you. I was wondering. <laughs> yep, that's me. That's me doing a fit test there. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so these are called fit tests. You mm. wear a mask, and then they put a tube on the mask to test the air that's inside the mask while you're actually wearing it, right? Mm. So I'm wearing this mask, breathing in it like normal, and this white tube right there is sampling air. It's pulling air out of the mask while I'm breathing it. And then this other blue tube is testing air that's just outside the mask. So we can ask how many particles are inside the mask and how many particles are outside the mask, right? While somebody's actually wearing it, right? Now, I've done this test. Um, there's a, a doctor in Beijing uh, who also did similar tests like this. Um, also, the person who co-founded Smart Air with me, um, Anna, so she's female, um, and she's from China. So some people wonder about whether masks fit um, people of different uh, ethnic backgrounds, better or worse. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll have her data in there as well. Mm -hmm. We tested a variety of masks, and uh, here's what we found right here. Um, so these particles, by the way, these are 0.01 to 1 micron. So these would include virus sized particles. These would include the coronavirus. And what you can see is for most of these masks, most of the N95 masks are over here on the left. And you can see that the performance here is quite high. So for example, this one all the way on the left, on my face, that captured 99.7% of particles. Wow. Uh, while it was on my face, while I was actually wearing it, right? Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes they perform worse, sometimes on, you know, different people's faces. Um, Anna's results were slightly worse than mine. So, for example, this one right here is Anna. Um, that was 99.1%. The worst mask on her face was 92.9%, right? Mm. So, yes, that's worse, but still very high. Like, if you ask your, like, if I said, hey, this mask is going to prevent you from breathing 93% of particles, the size of a virus, is that enough? Like, is that enough for it to be worth it? Like, yeah, right? I mean, who would say mm -hmm. no to 93%, right? Right, um, especially if there's scores. nothing, but if there, uh, there's nothing 100% for sure, right? So over 90% is pretty good. 
Yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody would expect that, that you get a hundred percent unless you were wearing some sort of crazy hazmat suit or something mm-hmm. like that. Right. Things right. were like plastic all over your face or something. Right. Like that, right. Um, so yeah, nobody would expect that. I, I would point out here though, um, this is a surgical mask over here on the right. That was 63%. Mm. Right? Now I think this makes sense to anybody who's ever worn a surgical mask because they don't fit very tightly. Right. Right. Usually on the side, you can feel that the surgical mask is not touching your face very tightly. Right. And that's yeah. what tests find. Right. So if we scroll back up to look at just, so just how effective are surgical masks at filtering particles, we can see the surgical mask here scored 80%, which is quite high. Mm-hmm. Right. But then we ask, well, if we take into account how well it fits the face, then it goes lower. Now this was 63%. Right. Mm-hmm. Meaning, yes, air leaks in the side of surgical mask, right? But the problem is people often think that if any air leaks, then it's ineffective, right? Mm-hmm. But 63% is still a lot better than zero, right? So I'm not saying, hey, you shouldn't buy a, a, a well-fitting mask. Of, of course, you know, tighter fit is going to be better, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody's arguing the other side of that. But the interesting question is, if, if I can't find a mask that doesn't fit, sorry, if I can't find a mask that fits very well, mm-hmm. is it just worthless? Should I just do nothing? Or is something better than nothing? And this data is very clear. 63% is, is better than nothing. Um, this is only on one person's face, but other tests have found, if, if people Google smart air and surgical masks, they can find uh, other data on that. Um, so this is basically, you know, this is the basic answer to whether masks can capture virus-sized particles. Um, and the answer is they can, right? I think maybe the next question that we would ask then is, okay, well, is there any evidence that masks actually protect people from getting sick, right? Right. Um, or do you have any questions about the, the filtration first? Uh, I just want to make sure the audience understands the takeaway point. Based on the data you showed me, it looks like it's definitely better to wear something, some kind of mask, than nothing. And also depends on the different type of masks. Uh, some definitely. masks definitely works better than others, especially if the fit is very well. That's mm-hmm. exactly right. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so in, in, in general, these um, N95 or even N99, so actually one thing I'll, I might point out to, um, to, to the viewers, um, this mask over here on the left side, that is actually what's called an N99 mask. Um, oh. Fortunately, the, the terms here are very easy. An N95 blocks 95% of particles, <laughs> right. 0.2 microns or above. An N99 is 99%. So it's just, it's just slightly higher, right? Um, right. So this is actually an N99 mask. Um, the only downside with N99 masks, well, one is they tend to be a, a bit more expensive, about a dollar. This one's about a dollar or two more expensive than um, this one right here, the 9001V. That's an N95. Mm. Um, so that one is about a dollar or two cheaper than the N99. Um, the other problem is that they N99s tend to be um, a little bit harder to breathe through, which makes sense, right? right? I mean, it, if it's filtering more particles, it's probably going to be harder to breathe through, right? Right. But yes, masks, uh, masks do fit. fit. Uh, these N95, N99s, they tend to fit people better than the less professional masks, uh, like surgical masks. Um, and also these, these ones on the right are mostly sort of commercial masks or like consumer masks. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the Toto Bobo right here. There's a Respro, which is the bicycle mask. Mm. Um, there's one called I Can Breathe. There's also the Vog mask. These ones tend, in the data that I've seen, these ones tend to fit people's face not as well as the 3M N95 more sort of professional masks. So that's another thing that people might look for. Right. Just to add a real life data point is when I interviewed doctors who uh, went to Wuhan to help with the psychotherapy work Hmm. in the Wuhan hospital in uh, February when the coronavirus situation got really bad, what they, their protocol was to wear N95 in the hospital whenever they're directly facing people who are diagnosed with coronavirus mm-hmm. the whole time. And if they are working other settings with 
uh, patients who are not diagnosed or unclear, they wear surgical mask. So, um, so far, based on what I heard and what they heard is no volunteer went to Wuhan and stayed there for over a month working directly with patients uh, who are diagnosed. None of them got infected. Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say, I mean, I imagine that they were probably saving some of the N95 masks for, you know, they probably didn't have a huge supply of masks, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if it were me and I had all the N95 masks in the world, then I would probably just wear them all the time, right? So like, for example, when I'm, when I'm in Beijing or when I'm in India uh, and I'm biking or walking outside, I just wear N99 masks. But oh. supply is not a problem right? under, under my normal life, right? Mm -hmm. But if supply is limited, you might want to save the N95 masks for the very critical times when you're directly dealing with a, a known patient. Mm -hmm. And then for other times where it's less serious, you might, you might use a, a mask that's not as effective, but, you know, saves the N95 for the more critical times. Mm -hmm. that, that would be logical to me. Right. Yeah. All right. Shall we go on to whether masks actually prevent infections? Yes. I'm so this curious is, about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is an interesting question because showing that masks actually capture viruses is a somewhat different question, right? Mm -hmm. Once we actually assign people to wear masks, now we're asking a slightly different question, right? Now we're looking at sort of more real world um, situations. Mm -hmm. We're looking at people's behavior. So, you know, how does wearing a mask change their behavior? Some people have actually argued that people should not wear masks because they give people a false sense of security, right? Mm -hmm. The idea here is, oh, I wear a mask and now I think I'm 100% protected. And so then I behave irresponsibly, right? Maybe I get really close to sick people, or I, uh, I spend more time around sick people than I would otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. So some people actually argue that masks are dangerous because they actually make us less responsible, right? Now, that's not a crazy thought, right? Um, we can make that logic work in our heads, but we'll see data here, right? If that logic is true, then we should find actually worse results for people who are assigned to wear masks, right? So this is a really interesting question, right? Right. So, so let's check it out. Um, these are just some of the... So, okay, so one, another question I wanna ask as we're, as we're doing this is surgical mask versus N95 mask, right? There are definitely mm -hmm. people out there who say you have to have an N95 mask um, surgical masks uh, just don't work, right? Uh, because the filtration efficiency is lower and because they don't fit as well. I think that's a perfectly good intuition to have. In fact, Smart Air on our Twitter, we actually polled people. We told them about a study. We said there's a study where they randomized nurses to wear either a surgical mask or an N95 mask during flu season, right? So they're working mm -hmm. in hospitals, people have the flu and other illnesses. And then the researchers assign some people to wear a surgical mask and they assign other people to wear um, an N95 mask. And we just ask people, before we show you the data, which do you think worked better? We polled people. And 68% of people said they thought the N95 mask would work better, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that would have been my guess, right? 14% mm -hmm. um, actually said the surgical masks and 17% uh, said neither. Uh, oh. I suppose they, they mean uh, <laughs> that none of them worked. Right. Mm. What they found, though, is that there was no significant difference between how many nurses got infected with the N95 mask or the surgical mask. Mm. Right. That's really interesting. Right. The surgical masks were just as effective as the N95 mask. Uh, and if anything, so it was it was seven percent with a surgical mask got infected versus eight percent with the N95 mask. So it's, it's not even in that direction, right? right? You might think, oh, maybe it was a difference, but it was small. You know, the N95 was better, but only slightly better. Um, the data's not even showing that, right? right. It, it's actually slightly in the opposite direction, but, but the difference here is not statistically significant. Now, at that point, you might say, okay, well, that's only one study. You know, it's randomized. It's, you know, it's a strong design. Um, they, they had 2,862 healthcare workers. 
the, the large sample, right? Mm -hmm. But still, you know, studies, sometimes you find one thing, sometimes you find something else. So we looked at another study. There's another study where they, again, randomly assigned uh, healthcare workers to wear N95 or surgical masks. And what they found here was, again, no significant difference here, right? So, and again, surgical masks were slightly more effective. So t in this study, 20% of people who had surgical masks got infected with, uh, with influenza. Um, and 22% with the N95 mask got infected. So what we're finding here is these two studies, no difference between a surgical mask and an N95 mask, which is really interesting, right? Mm. But at this point, you might think, aha, maybe, maybe some smart listeners are out there thinking, ah, right, I've, I've got it. I understand what's going on. Neither of these studies have what scientists call a control group, right? Both groups are wearing masks. So maybe it's that actually masks don't work. And so if surgical masks don't work and then N95 masks also don't work, then there's no difference, right? If they mm. both don't work, then there's no difference, right? We haven't actually established that they work, right? To establish that they work, we need to make some people not wear a mask, right? right. We need people who don't wear masks to compare to people who do wear masks, right? Mm -hmm. And those studies that I showed you, we didn't have, they, everybody was wearing a mask, right? So to do that, the problem is, well, are we really going to make a nurse not wear a mask? Like, doesn't that seem kind of wrong to, to force nurses to treat sick people without a mask? I mean, we're pretty sure they work, right? But, but it's, it just seems, it's, it seems wrong to, to not make them wear a mask. So one way that people have done this is with a study I was talking about before with families at the home, right? Mm. That is a place where people routinely do not wear masks, even though they are in close contact with sick people. Therefore, the researcher said, well, it's ethical, it's okay if we randomly assign some people to wear masks and some people to not wear masks, right? So in this study in Australia, they assigned people to randomly wear, uh, they randomly assigned some parents whose kids had the flu, to wear either an N95, a surgical mask, or nothing. Mm. Right? So now we truly have a, ma a group that's not wearing a mask. Right? And then the researchers tracked how many of the parents got the flu. So they're taking care of their kids who are sick with the flu. How many of these parents also get the flu later? Right? So what they find is this. Of the parents who are not wearing a mask, that was 17% got the flu. Now that's kind of interesting, right? It's not 100%, all right? It's not even 50%. 17% It's not a super high rate, right? Mm. Now some of these parents, maybe they had the flu before. Um, some of these, maybe they, they had the similar flu in years past, right? So mm. we don't know. But anyway, what we do find is that the people who were, the parents who were assigned to wear masks did indeed get infected less than people who didn't wear a mask. So of the parents who, who were assigned to not wear a mask, 17%. Surgical mask, 5%. And an N95, 4%. So basically the risk here is a third, right? So from a roughly 15% to 5%. That's, that's roughly the difference that we're talking about for, with masks versus not. Now, what I said before though, these results, are for the parents who continued to wear the mask during the study. Right. If you look at the parents who stopped wearing the mask, and they, they measured this both by asking the parents, and sometimes the researchers actually went to people's houses and observed whether the parents were still wearing the mask. So if you look at the parents who stopped wearing the mask, there was no benefit. Mm. Now, some people interpret, I literally have heard people interpret that as masks are not effective. Mm. That seems wrong to me, right? Quite I think misleading. The, if, it's misleading, um, right? Right. At least you should present both way to people, so you know people can pick and choose and decide how they think about it, instead of like cut half the story, tell the public. Yeah. Right. I mean, I heard somebody on the news. I heard a, a representative from the World Health Organization the other day on the news, mm. and she was complaining that that she sees people in public. Um, not wearing masks properly, right? Sometimes people have them over just over their mouth, not over their nose, 
-hmm. sometimes I, you know, I've seen this too, where people will just wear it around their neck rather than on their face, right? Yeah. I mean, now, okay. First of all, those people, the people who are wearing it around their neck, they know they're not wearing it properly, right? Mm -hmm. They are choosing to do that. That is a choice, right? Mm -hmm. They're not so dumb that they think a mask works on their neck right? Mm -hmm. So really, it's a question of compliance rather than a question of, of, of expertise or knowledge. I think mm -hmm. that's really the more important question here, right? And if the question is of compliance, people have masks, but they're not wearing them enough or they're not wearing them properly, then why are we telling people just to not wear masks? Instead, it seems like we should tell people, hey, masks work, but you have to wear them. <laughs> right? I mean, mm. doesn't that seem like the, the, the more, re if the problem is that people aren't wearing them enough, well, tell people to wear them more mm -hmm. rather than just say, give up and say, well, just don't wear a mask. Right? Right. That, that drives me crazy. Cause, cause again, <laughs> they're right that people don't always wear masks properly, mm -hmm. but the conclusion is not then, well, so we just shouldn't wear masks. That's ridiculous. Right? So I think that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, I will say there are, um, there are other studies w that um, I know of one other study comparing N95 and surgical masks that found no difference. So that's mm. three studies mm. that found no difference um, in infection rates. But I do know two studies that did find that N95 masks were more effective among uh, healthcare workers. Huh. Those two studies were in China. Oh. Now, I don't know if there's something different about hospitals there. They were also 10 years ago. It was about 2000. Mm. They were after SARS. Not during SARS, but after SARS. Mm. Um, so I, I want to make sure that, that I'm not misrepresenting here. So we have several studies that find no difference between N95 and surgical masks. But then we have a few studies that find N95 are better. So what we can definitely say is that there is, there is definitely enough evidence that surgical masks prevent infections. Mm. There is definitely enough evidence that N95 masks prevent infections from the flu and the cold. It's a little bit mixed whether an N95 is better than a surgical mask. A few studies find they're the same. A few studies find N95 are better. Now, mm. if it were me, and if I had all the masks in the world, then I would wear an N95 mask. Mm -hmm. But... If mm -hmm. I only had a surgical mask, I would definitely wear that. Right. I think that's a reasonable way to interpret it. Yeah, mask. especially for a lot of people, there are not a lot of options, right? I think right. personally, even just wearing surgical masks to go to the Asian groceries, I definitely feel safer than wearing nothing. And sounds like from the data, the N95 for the infection rate uh, of catching virus, the N95 mask is equal or better than the surgical mask, at least. That's right, mm -hmm. yeah. So the N95 is, is equal or, or potentially better mm. than a surgical mask. Mm -hmm. Now, one reason a surgical mask might, um, might perform as well is, well, first of all, surgical masks are actually pretty good at filtering particles, I think better than, than people think. But another reason that the researchers who can, so, so the researchers who conducted this study, they, they were also kind of surprised by this finding. Right? They said, wow, your surgical masks are so effective. Why is that? And they said, maybe one reason is that regardless of the mask, if you're wearing a mask, you can't touch your nose or your mouth. Right? Mm. The surgical mask or N95, they both do that. Right? So that could be one reason. We don't know. That's, that's just a theory. Right? Um, another theory might also be that N95 masks are less, generally less comfortable. Right? Mm. Surgical masks are easier to breathe in. They don't right. fit your face so tightly. Right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe, again, I'm just theorizing here, maybe people wear the surgical masks for longer and they don't take them off as much. Right? So maybe I'm a nurse and I'm wearing this N95 mask and it's, it's great, but like, oh, it's hot and it's annoying and then I have a break, so I take it off for a while and then I put it back on. Right? And then mm. a little in the afternoon, I take it off again. Right? So maybe people, although the surgical masks may be their worse performance, but maybe people wear them better because they're more comfortable, right? Um, these are just possibilities. Uh, we, we don't know. I, I think this, the state of the research is we, 
all we really know is whether they're effective or not. We don't know well enough all the reasons why and why not. Right, a lot of other factors sounds like, and some psychological factors. Yes. Personal, yeah, from personal experience, I definitely feel like for surgical mask, I could tolerate lo it longer. And uh, once I have some kind of mask on my face, I'm definitely more aware when my hand goes to my face, yeah. try to touch my face. Uh, because after reading the news from the very beginning, before I got any masks, I did start paying more attention, be more mindful about how many times and consciously I'm yeah. touching my face, yeah. right? I feel like I a lot surprised. of us now are having that feeling, right? Like, oh, I touch my face all the time. Why? Is right. Stopping? Yeah. Masks definitely can help with that. I'm more aware yeah. and I stop myself halfway easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, know what's, you know what's really fascinating? I, I, I think of this, you know, as a psychologist, that is my actual day job. Um, so, okay, so how people can have the complete opposite intuition or prediction mm. about the same question. So mm. when I, I posted an article about the N95 versus surgical masks, showing those two studies that found that they were just as effective. And in the comments, a lot of people said, multiple, multiple people said, oh, I know why. I know why that is. It's because when you wear a mask, you're more careful, right? If I wear a mask, that reminds me to be more careful. So not only to not touch my face, but maybe like I avoid other people because I'm, I'm, I'm in this mode of, of be careful, right? I'm in this mode of infection. Oh, I should mm -hmm. avoid other people. So maybe I take two more steps away from other people, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe I go to the further train on the subway that has fewer people or something like that, right? And mm -hmm. so people's, people very confidently said, that's why. That's why the N95 was not more effective than the surgical mask. But the interesting thing there is, I, I think that's a great hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's true, right? But isn't it interesting that other health experts are making the opposite prediction that masks make us more risky, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about that before, right? People right. say, oh, you shouldn't wear a mask because actually it makes you more of a risk taker, right? It makes you more sloppy. You go now, you go do anything you want because you feel like you're protected, right? It's the total opposite prediction, right? Mm. And both are logical, right? Both right. seem like reasonable things to say. Maybe humans behave like that, but they're the complete opposite, right? Mm. And who knows, maybe, maybe neither is true. The, the interesting thing, I think, like as a psychologist is that this is what we do every day, <laughs> Right? right. We think of, okay, mm -hmm. how would this affect somebody's behavior? Mm -hmm. And before we run studies, usually you don't really don't know, right? Mm -hmm. Like hypothesis A and hypothesis B are totally plausible to me. We don't know until we get the data. But among right. regular people, if we see the data, then we, oh yeah, of course it's because they're more careful. Oh, it's, you know, mm. false sense of security. But like, we need data on these questions. And so it, it, just, it just bugs me when I hear people very confidently mm. saying, oh, people shouldn't wear masks because it increases risky behavior. When, do we really have evidence for that? Because I can just say, in my own experience, I don't think that wearing a mask makes me behave irresponsibly. Maybe I'm wrong. You know, I've never systematically tested myself. But we right. should be careful mm -hmm. when we tell people not to do something, <laughs> you know, not wear a mask. Yeah, and I'm wondering for some healthcare professionals when they make this kind of prediction, how much that is from our own clinical experience. Mm -hmm. That sometimes I feel like it's really different than the evidence-based uh, approach. Mm -hmm. A lot of time for someone being working and their brain automatically filter out and catch all the standing out cases and then can make some kind of conclusion that, okay, because I have met so many people are more risk-taking. So I think based on my clinical experience, this is the case, yeah. right? Yeah, and that's very um, different than yeah. data-driven point. Yeah, and I, I also think too that like, I mean, so there are there is some evidence for this in different domains, right? Some people have argued, for example, that uh, having condoms encourages risky sexual behavior mm, right because right. you know it allows you to do something that you probably wouldn't want to do otherwise right mm -hmm. um so it's not a crazy thought but 
just because it happens sometimes or in certain domains, we should be careful in very confidently predicting that it's going to happen in other domains, right? Yeah. I just think it's interesting that both are, people are making opposite predictions, right? And both could be true. You know? Right. And they are so, for coronavirus, it's so important to decide how we're going to guide the public and the policies. For the condom example, I also heard that especially for China when they, uh, or Asian countries, when they decide whether to have those kind of education class for high school students or junior high school students, right? They're those kind of two conflict views. And then I think data driven uh, to certain direction and then eventually people think we'll have the education class to make it available uh, actually is still better than not. Yeah. Even if, yeah, so, so I read a review um, recently that said, in general, not, not always, but in general, when, when people are given sort of protective measures like masks and things like that, I don't know of anybody that's tested it with masks, but in other domains, they say, yes, some people seem to respond by taking more risks, but the overall effect, the average effect, tends to be protective. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, you know, if we're, if we're really concerned about public health, you know, the overall effect is probably what we should care about. Um, and if we're concerned about people taking risks, we, sh we can also remind people to say, hey, just, you know, just, just so you know, like it's not 100%. But I think with masks, it's weird because I, I don't think anybody out there thinks that a mask is 100%. Like mm -hmm. if we ask people on the street, do you think this mask means that there is a 0% chance that you will get infected? I don't think, I don't think people think that it's zero, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would be surprised if many people thought it was like that. Right. I think I saw some news comparing or some articles comparing those like full mask cover your whole body, mm. whole face that yeah. we often see in those zombie movies to yeah. talk about when do you really need over 99.9% yeah. yeah. of yeah. protection. Yeah. Like Ebola virus or, you know, things like that. Right. But anything, I think it's hard to see is 100% or yeah. any medication, any treatment clinically, no one ever can, yeah. can announce this is 100% effective. Yeah. And I think people wearing, for example, homemade masks right now, mm -hmm. they, I think they understand that. They, they're not, I don't think people think it's 100%, right? The, but the, right. the question really should be, is this better than nothing? Um, right. Which is actually a good segue into the DIY mask thing. Yeah, um, exactly. So peop yeah. after people adjust their expectation, know a lot of the data you just mentioned. Uh, now a lot of people cannot buy the mask. They are doing them their own. What kind of material they can, you know, think of choosing, what they should do, any suggestions on that? Yeah. So uh, I've got some cool data on this. Mm -hmm. And... The, so the interesting thing about this is, so researchers after the swine flu, mm. you remember that uh, oh, a few years ago? Right. After the swine flu, researchers, they noticed then there was a shortage of masks as well. Oh. And they said, hey, maybe in the future this is going to happen again. So what we're going to do is we should test homemade materials or house, household materials. How well do they work as, as masks? Mm -hmm. um, so they actually tested this years ago. And we have their data. And wow. so I look through their data. Um, there's actually mm -hmm. two good studies on this, peer review, uh published -huh. research. I really yeah. like researcher's mindset, right? Whenever something happened, start thinking about these questions, people often going to ask, have the research done, have the data out, so in the future, we can really refer to it. And they were right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, thankfully, we have their, their data, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So first, in the first study, um, here, here's the title right there. Uh, what they had people do is they gave them cotton t-shirts and a sewing machine. And then they had them make their own masks. They, they look sort of like this. This is, this is a mask that somebody made. Um, and what they did is they then shot uh, one micron size particles at the masks. And then they said, okay, what percentage did these homemade masks capture? And they compared that to a surgical mask. Um, so these, again, these, these are one micron large. This is about the size of anthrax. If readers remember like a few years ago, anthrax was, people were scared about that. Mm. Um, it's about the size of that. Um, so surgical masks captured 96% of these particles and the cotton, the t-shirt the captured 
of these particles. So again, not as good as a professional mask, but still a lot better than nothing. You know, right. Sixty nine percent is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, if you but if you remember the size of the coronavirus, it was 0. 0.12. This is right. one micron. So coronavirus is even smaller. So what the researchers did is they shot even smaller particles, even smaller than the coronavirus. These are 0 0.02. Um, these are called bacteriophage. Um, these are a different type of uh, particle, but they're smaller than the coronavirus. It's just all that, that's the important thing to know. And what they found here is that the cotton mask, the homemade mask, captured 50% of these very small particles, whereas a surgical mask captured almost 90% of these particles. So again, not as good as a professional mask, not nearly 100%, but definitely more than 0%, right? Now, again, we get to this question of, okay, but what about how well it's fitting on people's faces? What about when somebody actually wears the mask? So they did fit tests, like the one that I showed you before. Mm -hmm. And here it is on somebody's face. Um, this is for particles size 0 0.02 to 1 micron. So we're getting a range of particles here, uh, including virus size particles. And on, they did this on 21 volunteers' faces. And on average, it was 50%. Mm. So it's capturing 50% of the particles. So again, better than nothing, but not 100%, right? And, and the surgical mass here did a bit better than the tests we showed before. These are 80% when mm -hmm. people were actually wearing them. So again, better than nothing, but not 100%. So um, he, oh, here's actually a picture of another group of researchers doing the fit test uh, with a, a homemade mass. You can see the Mm. fit test machine here and then you can see a volunteer uh, wearing the the homemade masks kind of fun right um they also tested this with what they call a tea cloth in the u.s we would call that a dish towel right mm. here um that captured 60 percent of particles they also asked an interesting question is what if you wear them for a long time you know they start to get wet with your breath and does that affect how effective they are so they had people wear these masks for three hours. So by that time, it's pretty gross and humid and, and wet, right? Mm -hmm. And so they compared it with before and after. Now, these, again, were masks made out of dish towels. And it was 63% before. And after three hours, it was 68%. Mm. So it actually became slightly more effective. Right. Um, and as you can, you might be able to understand this, the, the, or your, your intuition might might lead you in this direction the the more water and the more particles are stuck in the mask it actually becomes a better filter right mm. harder to breathe in but a better filter mm. right and as we saw before the surgical mask did better and in this study they tested n95 masks which did even better right mm -hmm. they also tested them on children oh. and they found that so on adults while actually wearing the mask it was 60 percent on adults and about 52 percent on children so other studies have found this with um, N95 masks. Even when they're made for children's faces, they tend not to fit as well on children's uh. faces. It's, it's just harder to get a mask. I mean, children are growing. It's all probably also harder for them to, to make sure that the mask is, is you know, properly on the face. Um, so several studies have found, our, t our own tests have found that masks tend to work less well on children, um, but better than nothing. Right. So if I mean, if I had a child in a polluted city or, you know, near somebody who was sick, a mask is better than nothing. Right. Yeah, Here's for, a picture of a test we did. Oh, uh, for in, children. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. For children, the other difficult thing, um, not just for mask itself, it's children's behavior. Because I saw some funny articles in China after the coronavirus. Now a lot of children went back to school. But mm. for younger children, they... Uh, went to school with a yellow mask, but came back mm. with a pink one because oh, no. they switched <laughs> at school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's hard to like explain these things and have them just instantly understand and do mm -hmm. it, right? It'll, right? it'll take time. Fortunately, it seems like kids don't get as affected by the coronavirus mm -hmm. as, as adults. Right. Um, so these were two studies um, that were super helpful. Um, but another question that people are asking is, okay, so we saw um, cotton t-shirt. And we saw a dish towel, like a towel, cotton towel. Mm -hmm. But what about all these other materials that people might have at home? Right. Well, there's another study where they said, okay, let's look at just a bunch of different materials that people might have at home. And here's their effectiveness against one micron size particles. This is about, again, about the size of anthrax. 
Mm. So here we have surgical mask at 97%. Then a vacuum cleaner bag. I know I've, a lot <laughs> of people on Twitter have been asking about these because um, they think, well, a vacuum cleaner has got a really strong filter in it, right? Mm. Um, and they're right, 95% in this study. Wow. Dish towel, a cotton blend shirt, um, cotton shirt, a pillowcase was 65%, scarf was Not 62%. Bad. Uh -huh. um, on the bottom here was silk at 58%. Uh -huh. So you can see all of these materials are capturing over 50% of particles, right? Uh -huh. This is not on people's face. This is just, you know, the, the filtration of the materials themselves. But they also shot smaller particles. These are those 0 0.02 microns. So we're talking even smaller than the coronavirus. And you can see all the materials are less effective, but uh -huh. still pretty effective. So that vacuum cleaner bag, that went from something like 90, 95% to now 86% with mm. these smaller particles. Dish towel, 73%. Um, cotton blend t-shirt, 70%. The scarf, 49%. So still capturing a decent number, a decent percentage of these small particles. All right? yeah. Now, it would be super easy to look at this and say, well, we should use either the vacuum cleaner, because that was super, super high, or we should use the dish towel. Problem is can I breathe through this thing, right? Because masks mm -hmm. need to not only capture particles, but they need to be breathable, right? right. And so researchers, um, oh, before I get to that question, they also asked if I double layer it, will uh, it be more effective? Right. And so, for example, here's a single layer of dish towel. This is against uh, one micron particles. Uh, so the single dish towel was, a single layer of dish towel was 83%. A double layer was 97%. Now, it's not that much better, right? I mean, considering how much harder two layers would be to breathe in, 14% mm -hmm. is okay, right? Mm. With a t-shirt, it was even smaller. Mm. So a single layer of t-shirt was 69%. Two layers was 71%. Almost, almost nothing. Same with a pillowcase. Just 1% difference. So it seems that in general, double layering is probably not worth it. Um, maybe not a bad idea, but it also affects breathability. So the interesting thing here is that the, so again, like looking at these results, you might say again, vacuum cleaner or dish towel, those are the best uh, materials. But the researchers themselves who wrote this, they, they actually suggested the pillowcase and mm -hmm. the cotton t-shirt instead. And why? Because they were the best combination of effectiveness at capturing particles, but also breathability. So here's their data on breathability. So basically, this is just how hard is it um, to breathe through it? Wow. Um, or actually, here we have it as coded as breathability, so it's easy. Um, so things over here are easier than a surgical mask in percentages, mm -hmm. and things over on the left side here are harder than a surgical mask. So so the so surgical mask is sort of set to the, the sort of baseline, right? And so pillowcase, for example, is actually easier to breathe through than a surgical mask. So is a cotton t-shirt, a scarf, linen, silk, and even double layer of t-shirt, slightly easier than a surgical mask. But remember that vacuum cleaner bag? Mm. It was almost 100% harder wow. to breathe through that than a surgical mask, right? And a double layer dish towel was more than 100% harder to breathe through Whoa. than a surgical mask. We're gonna suffocate ourselves. <laughs> it would be not fun, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not impossible. Right. If, if somebody out there really wants to do a double layer of dish towel, OK, <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> but the re I agree with the researchers that we probably want to combine these two variables. Right. We, we want to combine effectiveness and breathability. So what they mm. recommended was the pillowcase and the T-shirt, which were effective at capturing particles, but also very breathable. Mm. Right? So that's sort of the, the bottom line on the on the DIY masks. Um, I think the take home message there is they're effective. Mm -hmm. um, they're better than nothing. Certain materials work better than others, but remember that they're not as good as, as N95 masks. But again, I don't think anybody thinks they're as good as an N95 mask, right? So it's kind of arguing against nobody. Um, one last thing I'll say is that after we publish this data, um, this post just went crazy. Um, so many people out there were trying to make masks and they, this data was, you know, we sort of took scientific research, but then made it in a way that I think people can understand and, and mm. use. Um, the, the, that was not our test. Um, but all these people started asking about other materials. They said, what about like a coffee filter was a really popular mm. one, right? Or we thought, oh. what about paper towel, right? Lots of people have paper towel at home. Mm. Um, and so 
there's all these other materials that people might use. And so what we've been doing recently is Smart Air is a social enterprise. We sell purifiers, but we don't, we don't make a lot of money. It's not really our goal. Um, so we started a crowdfunding campaign to help raise money to buy equipment, testing equipment like they have to test more materials. Mm. Um, and since then, we've had people donating money so we can buy materials, buy testing equipment, and then publish all the data so that it's open and everybody can see it, right? So it's not, it's not even behind a scientific journal paywall. It's just, it's just going to all be out there, right? Mm. Um, and we've actually already started testing these materials. Although people can continue to donate money, please, please do. We need, we need more equipment if people are willing to donate a dollar, five dollars, or ten dollars. Um, mm-hmm. That will go to buying, buying more materials and buying testing equipment. Um, and so probably next week, we will be publishing even more tests on more materials that we can find, uh, including paper towels and uh, coffee filters. So, Great. Yes, so, yeah. I will. Please give me the link to yeah, those platforms the and the donate channels. I will put them all on the show note. Uh, so people, whenever they watch this YouTube video or listen to the podcast, they have a way to get to those links, know how to find more information and the research results. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and people can also... If they, and even if, I'm sure we'll post links too, but if you just Google smart air filters and then, you know, DIY mask or homemade mask, you can find any of this stuff. And then we link to all the original research articles. If anybody wants to, right. to look up the originals, they can, they can find the methods and mm-hmm. um, all the data and even more fun data that, that uh, obviously we don't report everything in the, in the article. So there's more to be discovered. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Thomas, today for yeah. sharing all this wonderful research with us. And uh, um, especially to myself, I think a lot of the research are quite new to me. And a lot of questions you are answering uh, in this presentation, actually, I have asked those questions myself, but have no idea where to find the answer. So I think by listening to this and watching all this data, uh, hopefully audience can feel the same, that they really now know better um, at least know how to choose between masks. If there's no options to buy any, what to do at home, at least what material to consider. Yeah, that's exactly what, what it was like for me when I started to get worried about air pollution. So, you know, I was living in Beijing. It was uh, 2013. The air pollution was really bad that winter. And I wanted to know, like, do air purifiers work? How do they work? What's the, you know, exact percentages on this? Um, do I need to buy? What's the difference between those expensive ones and all the other ones? And the thing is, the answers are out there. Researchers have tested these questions before, but there wasn't, it was really hard to find them, right? Mm-hmm. I had to dig and dig and, and find this stuff. And oftentimes I had to do some tests myself even. And so really one of my big goals with Smart Air, and if, if people are considering donating to our mask test, this is, this is what you're supporting, is getting answers to these questions and also communicating it in a way that people can understand and is easily accessible. That's really, that's really it. Because a lot of the answers to these questions, like can masks capture viruses? The answer is pretty simple, right? And the data's mm-hmm. out there, right? Yeah. Can air purifiers lower PM 2.5 in your home? We know the answer to this question, right? It's just oftentimes not in a convenient format. Um, and people haven't done the, the sort of interpretation of the scientific research um, to make it easy. So right. I hope that smart air is helping at least in some way that, that because I found it hard to find the answers to these questions. That's mm-hmm. what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to put it out there so that people can do it and they can make the right decision for themselves based on the data. And that usually involves, you know, in, in air purifiers, it usually involves not spending a thousand dollars for clean air. Right. Yeah. Or it involves, you know, for masks, it involves doing something rather than nothing. Is the right. Answer. Yeah, and especially for coronavirus right now. I know there's financial stress, there's health concerns. So all this information could be really helpful to guide people to the, to the right direction or a direction at least they can consider. Yeah, mm-hmm. right on. Yeah, great. Thank you. And thanks, right. thanks for Smart Air doing all this wonderful work. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh-huh. I hope you're well. Yeah, okay. All right. Bye. Thank you for watching our videos or listening to our podcast. If you like our show, please feel free to subscribe, like, and share it. If you have any questions or feedback, we would always love to hear from you. You can either email us or leave feedback on our website at mindbodygarden.com. 
or directly under the YouTube video channel. Thank you very much for your company today, and hopefully to hear from you or have you with us next time.